and 24 by 24 continues live now. Hi there, everyone. Uh, this is Rabbi Maurice Schwartz, uh, broadcasting from Hashmonaim, a little settlement, a yeshuv, just outside of Modin in Israel. I'm the director of education for the Florence Melton Schools of Adult Jewish Learning, a project of the Melton Center of the Hebrew University. <clears throat> and it's a pleasure uh, to be one of uh, your co-teachers for this next hour of learning uh, on the topic of Amalek, remembering the arch enemy of the Jewish people. Uh, this is actually um, a, the first lesson of a new four-part series that the Florence Melton School has put together recently on the topic of remembrance or zachor, the transmission of history through the lens of memory. Um, so it's, it's going to be very exciting. This is really the first time it's being taught uh, uh, publicly, except for a small little pilot trial edition this past summer. Um, and uh, looking forward to sharing uh, this learning experience with you. Before I continue, I want to just introduce my co-teacher, um, Ruth Bergman from Detroit. Hi, I'm Ruth Bergman, I'm sitting in Farmington Hills, Michigan, and it's a pleasure to teach with Maury. Um, I teach Melton here for the Detroit Jewish community, and that is my connection to Maury. So why don't we get started? Maury? <clears throat> Wonderful. Great. Um, there were sources. I mean, everything we do in Melton is always text-based. So there is a whole packet of sources. Hopefully, uh, you've had a chance to access them. Um, and they are um, they're texts which relate to today's topic about Amalek, um, the nation that uh, first attacked uh, the Jewish people in their wilderness um, following their exodus from Egypt. This is the first uh, lesson, as I mentioned, in a series, and it's really, we're using Amalek as the specific mitzvah in the Torah that requires us to remember, to remember something. There are actually six places in the Torah where we are actually instructed to remember something particular. We're, we're instructed to remember the exodus from Egypt, to remember the sin of the golden calf, to remember the giving of the Torah, to remember the Shabbat, to remember the attack of Amalek, the subject of our lesson today, and to remember the sin of Miriam. So there's lots of discussion about why these things, why these specific six things. That's not really what we're going to be talking about today. We're focusing on one of them. But we're using it as a paradigm to address a much larger question. And you can see that on our roadmap here, uh, where it says setting the stage. Um, Really, when it comes specifically to Amalek, what are we commanded to remember um, specifically? To what end are we commanded to remember this? What is the idea the Torah has here to remember an event? And in a more general way, how are individuals or a nation to go about preserving a memory of something that none of them have actually witnessed? It's one thing if I tell you to remember something that happened yesterday or something even that happened a month ago, or even a year ago, to remember this your whole life. And, but how do you remember something that you never experienced? And one other question we're going to be dealing with, uh, Ruth will introduce this in her section very soon, is um, the question of, is there one mitzvah here, or two? Because the Torah text is a little complicated. On the one hand, it tells us to remember, and the other hand, it tells us not to forget. So before we actually look at the Torah text from two books of the Torah, we're going to take a look at a um, text by Professor Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi. <clears throat> this is actually text one. Uh, Professor Yerushalmi lived from 1932 till 2009. He's a professor of Jewish history, culture, and society at Columbia University between 1980 and 2008. So here, um, he wrote a book, actually. The book is called Zachor, Biblical and Rabbinic Foundations. And he, um, in his book of Zachor, he addresses this global question. If I can use the word global here. I can, I can right? It's not syndicated. And this global question he addresses is, what are we meant to remember? What does it mean when the Torah instructs us to remember? So in this passage, let's see what he writes. We're going to read some of these um, some, some parts of the passage. So he begins by saying the following. 
No more dramatic evidence is needed for the dominant place of history in ancient Israel than the overriding fact that even God is known only insofar as he reveals himself historically. Which is an interesting point. When God speaks to us in the Torah, the language God uses in addressing us, in addressing our ancestors, is constantly about things that God did historically for us. If we go down to line 9, um, for instance, when God introduces himself directly to the entire people at Sinai, nothing is heard of his essence or attributes. He doesn't tell us, you know, what, who, what God is, that God doesn't describe what God is uh, or what God um, plans to do or his, God's relationship to us. God says the following, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. And that is sufficient. For here as elsewhere, ancient Israel knows what God is from what he has done in history. And if that is so, then memory has become crucial to its faith and ultimately to its very existence. In other words, from the very beginning, there at the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, at the revelation itself, God introduces himself in historic terms, or historical terms, emphasizing that he is the God who took us out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Let's skip down to um, line 29. The Yerushalmi here continues on line 29, uh, page 6. I'm sorry, that's not the page number. Page 2. Page 2. If the command to remember is absolute, there is nonetheless an almost desperate pathos about the biblical concern with memory and a shrewd wisdom that knows how short and fickle human memory can be. Not history, as is commonly supposed, but only mythic time repeats itself. If history is real, then the Red Sea can only be crossed, can be crossed only once. And Israel cannot stand twice at Sinai. So in this section, Yerushalmi points out that the events that we're talking about are events that only happen once. They're not going to happen again. We're not going to once again experience them. And, but yet, even though we're not going to experience them, he continues in line um, 36 at the end of the line, yet the covenant is to endure forever. I make this covenant with its sanctions, not with you alone, but, with, but both with those who are standing here with us today, before the Lord our God, and also with those who are not with us here this day. And says Yerushalmi, it's an outrageous claim to make a covenant with people who weren't there at the making of the covenant, and to tell them that they're making it because of the fact that it's as if they are, to, they are there because they're to remember that day, as if they were there themselves. Yerushalmi then continues in this final section of the passage, to remind us that each and every one of us, year after year, participates in the same activity of passing on memory. Because he talks about, actually, references here, the place in the book of Joshua, where as the Jewish people enter into the land of Canaan, after 40 years of wandering in the desert, they're told to place stones there to take to take stones there out of the water, and it says, um, says Yerushalmi, surely there comes a day when your children will ask you in time to come, saying, "What mean you by these stones? These stones that you took out of the water? What are they for?" Then you shall say to them, "Because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it passed through the Jordan, not the stone, but the memory transmitted by our fathers is decisive." if the memory embedded in the stone is to be conjured out of it to live again for subsequent generations. If there can be no return to Sinai, then what took place at Sinai must be born along the conduits of memory to those who were not there that day. Isn't this what we do year after year at the, at the Passover Seder? We talk about something that we never saw with our own eyes. We pass on a memory that we don't actually have of our own. This is a very complicated challenge, if you think about it. Because while it may be our responsibility to pass on a memory, to what extent is that memory influenced over and over by the context in which we're remembering the actual event? 
In other words, the new things that happen in generation after generation certainly impact on the way we remember it and how we tell it to the generation that's yet to come. What happens to memory as it's passed down through the generations? And what about it, then, are we actually being instructed to remember? Is there some kernel, some very specific piece that has to remain intact, that we need to pass on generation after generation? Even though the story may change a little bit, the way we tell it, but is there a kernel, a specific part that needs to be retained? And is that actually possible, given the fact that we did not experience it ourselves? So these are the questions that Yerushalmi raises in this opening text. Now I'm going to turn the lesson over to Ruth to, so that we can take a look at some of the biblical passages uh, regarding Amalek. Hi, everyone. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is uh, take a look at the two places in the Torah where we have the story of uh, Amalek. And the first comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 17, and the second comes from Deuteronomy, chapter 25. And what I'd like to do, actually, is look at the Hebrew, and I'll translate it, because there are some particular things that I'd like to point out about the differences between the two texts that I think are going to help us understand some of the issues that Maury brought up and that we're talking about today. <clears throat> So if we look at the text in Exodus, it says, Amalek im Yisrael that Amalek came and fought with Israel in a place called Rephidim. And the language that's used is the language of war. They fought. It was a battle. And then it tells us that Moses told Joshua to choose men and go out and fight a battle. So again, we have this military language being used, fight against Amalek tomorrow. And then Moses explains that he's going to go up onto the rise and he is going to have the staff of God with him. And then verse 9, uh, excuse me, verse 10 tells us, Vayaz Yoshua ka'ashir amar lo Moshe, that Joshua did everything that Moses had told him, lehi lachem ba'amalek, to make war. So in three verses, we have the term for war three times. Then it tells us that whenever Moses would raise his hands, Israel would prevail, v'gavar Yisrael, which is also a military term, v'chashir yaniach yado v'gavar amalek. And whenever Moses got tired and his hands went down, then amalek prevailed. Uh, then it tells us that uh, they took a, a rock and they put it underneath Moses because he was getting tired and they physically held his hands up. <clears throat> Let's look at verse 13. Vayachalosh Yehoshua et Amalek ve'et Amo lefi So Joshua weakened Amalek and the nation with the sword. He didn't completely destroy them, which is why Amalek does appear in later stories, including in the book of Numbers. And I want you to remember that word Vayachalosh, because it's going to be very important when we look at Deuteronomy. Then God tells Moses to write, Tov, Zod Zikaron Vesefer, to write this memorial in a document and to tell it to Joshua. And God says, Ki macho et amalek I, God, am going to be the one who will utterly blot out Amalek from under the heavens. And then Moses builds an altar. And he calls, uh, God is my, my miracle. And he says, Kiyad al kes ya, that our hand is on the throne of God, milchama la shemba amalek midor lador, that God is going to fight amalek in every generation. And so it seems as though God is going to be the one to do the destroying, and we are to have a memorial of these events. And the question is, what does that mean? And if, of course, Amalek is at some point destroyed, then how can Amalek continue to be destroyed in every generation? What do we mean when we say Amalek? Because it can't refer to the actual people, because as we all know, they no longer exist. So let's take a look now at the Deuteronomy text and see the difference between what we saw in Exodus and what we're seeing here in Deuteronomy. 
And we have something here that's called an inclusio, and an inclusio is a, a bracketing. We have an idea that's the beginning of the text, and then the same idea in slightly different language at the end. And so it forms a little block, a little block of story. And this is where we're told to actually remember. It says, Remember what Amalek did to you um, on your way when you left Egypt. And the word Zahor is very, very strong language. It's even a stronger form than the command. It's actually called an infin infinitive absolute, if you're interested in the grammar. It's very, very tough language. Remember, don't forget, remember. And then it says, Asher karcha baderech, that they met you on the way, vayizanev becha, and they attacked from behind. The word vayizanev is like the word zanav, a tail, at the back. Vayizanev becha kol hanecha shalim acharecha. They attacked all the weak who were behind you. This is not a war. This is not one army attacking another army, unprovoked, because there is no provocation in Exodus, but it's a war nonetheless. This is an act of terrorism. This is an act against civilians. And you were tired and you were exhausted. And Amalek did not fear God. There are different ways of understanding that. We'll go with that translation for right now. And then it doesn't describe anything about the defeat of Amalek. It doesn't talk about the battle at all. It simply says you were attacked from behind and remember, I asked you to remember, back in Exodus, it says, Vayachalosh Yehoshua, that Joshua weakened Amalek. And here, in Deuteronomy, we are told that Amalek attacked the weak. So we have that connection. Who's weak and who's the victor? And then we're told, in verse 19, Vahaya bahaniach Hashem alokecha lecha mikol oivecha misaviv, ba'aretz asher Hashem alokecha noten lecha nachala rishta, that when God settles you and causes you to rest in the land that you are going to inherit, you erase the memory of Amalek from under the heavens, and then there's an itnachta. Stop. Don't forget. So it's not God who's going to be destroying Amalek. Now the job is ours to destroy Amalek. And then we have Lo Tishkach. And one of the questions that we'll be examining in our text coming up is what exactly is the difference between Zahor, remember, and Lo Tishkach, don't forget? Are they two ways of saying the same thing? Are they two different meets vote? And that tagline at the end, Lo Tishkach, what's it referring to? It could refer to the verse itself. You are told to blot out the name of Amalek, don't forget, you better do that. It could be, remember the episode, that Amalek attacked you in the wilderness, or it could mean remember something larger, remember the greater theme, unprovoked hatred, causeless hatred, what we call in Hebrew sin atrinam, because Amalek the nation, they'll come and they'll go, they'll be here and then they'll be gone, but unfortunately sin atrinam will always be with us, and so maybe that's what we're supposed to never forget. And then of course the question is, how do we do that? So why don't we take a look at our next text, Maury is going to study with you, and we'll try to find some answers to these questions. Thanks, Ruth. So the next text we're going to look at is actually a commentary, a perush uh, by, by Ramban, Nachmanides, um, lived in the 13th century, um, legal scholar in Spain. He, he's very famous for his commentary on uh, Torah, but also for his extensive commentary on oral tradition as well. <clears throat> he um, here you can take a look. He asks, he's obviously bothered by the same one of the same issues that Ruth just brought up um, a minute ago. In other words, how can think about this? How can we succeed in blotting out the name of Amalek if we are eternally instructed to never forget? In other words, if we're never going to forget, then how will we actually blot out the name? Because as we constantly fulfill our responsibility not to forget, we will be constantly recalling and therefore unable to completely blot out the name. So Ramban starts at this place and he has an interesting solution, one solution to this um, quandary. 
So here Ramban writes, uh, quoting from the text, um, Remember what Amalek did to you. And he writes, The correct interpretation, he says, appears to me, which is interesting, Ramban is not necessarily here transmitting a tradition that he has, but just suggesting an interpretation that appears most truthful to him. That the verse states that you are not to forget what Amalek did to us until we blot out his remembrance from under the heavens, and that we are to relate it to our children and to our generation, saying to them, Thus did the wicked one do to us, and therefore we have been commanded to blot out his name. So Ramban has an interesting twist on this. For him, the idea of remembering is almost translated into the idea of passing on from generation to generation. Remembering is a responsibility to pass something on from our, gener from our parents' generation to our children's generation. And in passing this on, what do we do? We are telling our children in each generation that when Amalek appears, so to say, blot out the name of Amalek. Now, how do we understand this? Because if we were really successful ultimately in blotting out the name of Amalek, then we wouldn't have to keep remembering this, right? That's the, exactly the problem here that we're, we're forced to address. So one idea might be here that Ramban, Ramban himself is suggesting to us the Torah, it know, the Torah itself knows there will never be an end to Amalek. Amalek, the nature of Amalek, the presence of Amalek-like nations will unfortunately always be a part of human existence. And therefore it's the responsibility to give our children and our grandchildren the heads up about that. That our ancestors dealt with this and we've dealt with this and they too will need to deal with this. And so the Torah is instructing us never forget to, to take note of the fact that there is a Malek and that in every generation it's our responsibility to blot them out. That is maybe to blot out their influence, to blot out their, 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 their existence in our lives to blot out what they stand for, even if that won't ultimately mean that we're actually erasing them completely from the world. Um, the way that we actually fulfill this uh, commandment annually, uh, rabbis instituted that on the Shabbat, prior to the observance of the Purim holiday, Shabbat is called Shabbat Parshat Zachor. And actually, on that Shabbat, we read from the, the uh, second text that Ruth just read from the book from Deuteronomy, chapter 25. And there, um, we, uh, we actually read that publicly and consider ourselves at that point to have fulfilled the Torah commandment to remember Amalek. But every year that we do this, I ask myself the question, I know that I just listened to the Torah's commandment to, re to, to remember, to blot out Amalek, but did I really fulfill the mitzvah of blotting out Amalek by listening to that? by remembering it, in other words, by hearing it publicly? Is that really an act of remembering? What does it take to ultimately fulfill the responsibility of zechirat of Amalek, of remembering Amalek, and mechiat Amalek, of blotting him out? We still don't have a perfect answer to that question, but we're, we're on our way. Again, the Ramban has given us a certain way of interpreting the text to lay for us the fear in the, of the notion that how can we deal with the um, blotting something out that we're forget, forever remembering by telling us that, no, that's the way it is. You will forever remember it so that every generation will take a stand to blot out the Amalek that they're faced with. Ruth, you want to continue? Yes. Um, thank you, Maury. So that question of is remembering or reading the Torah story about Amalek, is that enough? Does that qualify? Is that what uh, the Torah actually means when we talk about Amalek. And so we're going to take a look now at text 5. And this is a text by Rabbi Irving Greenberg, also known as Rabbi Yitz Greenberg. Um, and it's called Commemorating Jewish Destiny, Purim. And he says, Zachor is a mitzvah that has made modern Jews uncomfortable. The natural desire to forget and be happy collides with the ongoing pain of memory and analysis. When asked why President Ronald Reagan in 1985 initially declined to visit the Dachau concentration camp, 
A presidential aide explained that the president was an up type of person and did not like to grovel in a grisly thing. We unfortunately have the habit in modern culture sometimes of wanting to avoid the unpleasant and only remember the positive things. But of course, life isn't like that, and we do need to remember. So Rabbi Greenberg continues, modern people who are future-oriented stress the need to forgive. They argue that there will be no reconciliation as long as the memories of the cruelties and atrocities of the past are preserved and thrown in the face of those involved. That's an interesting statement, that there really can't be reconciliation without first facing what you've done. And actually, in the laws of repentance, the steps to repentance are that first, you have to acknowledge what you've done, and then you have to acknowledge that what you did was actually wrong. A lot of people will say, yeah, I did it, and I would do it again. So those are the first steps, and if you don't acknowledge it, and if it's not staring you in the face, then you just ignore it, then you haven't really moved on, and you can't really, hopefully, eventually, correct the things that you've done. So Rabbi Greenberg continues, it's line 11. Forget and forgive becomes the slogan. The argument can even take the form of an attack on the victims for keeping the memory alive. In May 1985, a storm of opposition arose against President Reagan's visit to the Bitburg, Germany military cemetery because the ceremony involved paying homage and laying a wreath in a cemetery with graves of SS soldiers. During the uproar, one German parliamentarian attacked the Jews for their unchristian-like refusal to forget the past. The primary lesson of Parashat Sahor is that true reconciliation comes through repentance and remembrance. Confronting the evils of the past is the most powerful generator of moral cleansing and fundamental reconciliation. Repentance is the key to overcoming the evils of the past. When people recognize injustice, they can correct the wrongdoing and the conditions that lead to it. In the 20th century, repentance has liberated many Christians from past stereotyping and hatred of Jews, thus beginning to transform Christianity into a gospel of love, which it seeks to be. You cannot have this sort of reconciliation if we don't remember and confront our past. And that is what Sahur is demanding that we do, that we never forget and we don't allow the perpetrators to forget either. Remembrance, he says, this is line 31, is key to preventing recurrence. Goaded by the memory of the failures of the 1930s, the indifference towards Jewish refugees, the American government in 1979 organized a worldwide absorption program for two million boat people. Goaded by memory of America's Jews and Israel, responded to the crisis of Soviet Jewry and belatedly of Ethiopian Jewry. Naivete and amnesia always favor the aggressors, the Amalekites in particular. The Amalekites wanted to wipe out an entire people, memory and all. Amnesia completes that undone job. Ingenuousness leads to lowering the guard, which encourages attempts at repetition. One of the classic evasions under Gertie Naive is the claim that Amalek is long since gone. Only primitive people are so cruel. Only madmen or people controlled by a Svengali Hitler type would do such terrible things. The mitzvah zahor is a stern reminder that Amalek lives and must be fought. So what Rabbi Greenberg is saying is that evil will return time and time again in the world. And it's up to us to be prepared for it, to remember it, and then to do something about it. And this goes beyond reading the Torah reading on the Shabbat or Purim, which of course is very important in and of itself. The question really becomes, what will that concern and involvement lead to? What kind of action will it lead to so that in the future, we can, in fact, eradicate Sinat Chinam, at least for our generation. And we have to take whatever action we can to confront that evil in the world. So that is Rabbi Greenberg's take on things. And um, this is way beyond just reading about the story, but the reading has to lead us to action over and over again and be vigilant about not allowing that causeless hatred to rise up in the next generation. So, uh, Maury, would you like to comment or move on to the next text? Yeah. Actually, I'm fascinated by the first line. I, I'm going back to that first line mm -hmm. when he claims that Zachor is a mitzvah that has made modern Jews. 
uncomfortable. Um, and I, I live here in the state of Israel now, 14 years, and one of the things that's uh, been a big part of uh, the, the rite of passage for every, so for so many Israeli teenagers, so many Israeli high school students, is to make their way uh, to uh, Eastern Europe, to make their way to Poland, to make their way to the concentration camps. It's a very powerful experience. Most of them have it in either 11th or 12th grade. It's, uh, it's, it's almost, it's become a rite of passage, but it's also become um, somewhat uh, controversial here. Um, how important is it for these youths to go on that trip? What is it about it that they're supposed to get out of the trip? I've done, there's actually later on in this four-part course that I mentioned at the beginning that this is the first of a four-part series. Um, when we we look at um, Polish Jewry and we look at some interesting texts um, written by um, second-generation survivors of the Holocaust who talk about the, who ask the question, you know, is it really the best thing for the Jewish people to continue to remember the Holocaust? to drill this in over and over. And the reason he says it is because it creates a certain lens through the reason, not just one source, several sources. It creates a certain lens through which we see everything. You know that the, we know that the, um, the early Israeli Chalutzim, the pioneers here who came here, let's, um, who had survived the Holocaust, um, they did everything they could to forget about that experience. Um, they didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to remember it. They needed to move on. Just like he says, the natural desire to forget and be happy collides with the ongoing pain of memory and analysis. He talks about the, the, the desire to move on, to go forward. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to go forward. And really, the way history will tell it is that it was the early 1960s Eichmann trials here in the state of Israel, which mm -hmm. brought it all out in public, on the televisions, on the radio, which caused people to really stop and deal with it and have to talk about it and rethink it. And that's what brought it to the fore. But for about, um, you know, a good, uh, you know, 12, 15 years here, survivors were not talking about it. And for the contention that they didn't want to. They didn't want to be thinking about themselves in that light. So I just wondered to myself, to what extent does it help us to remember a, a, a nation like Amalek? To what, ex what, to what point? Um, I understand what... Uh, Yitz Greenberg is saying here that, you know, in a certain way that the, the perpetrators need to remember what they did so that they can repent for it. But to, why is it so important that we remember what they did to us, according to <clears throat> Greenberg? Well, you know, if I may uh, say something, one of the things I find interesting is if you go back to the to the text in Shemot, when the when the Exodus text tells us what happened, they're being told to write a memorial in a book, but they're not the ones being commanded to remember. They don't have to be commanded to remember. They live through it. In Deuteronomy, that generation is gone. The generation that Moses is addressing in Deuteronomy, they either were very small children or they're the new generation. They didn't experience it. And when it says, Zahor asher asalacha amalek, remember what Amalek did to you, it doesn't mean it literally. It means what they did to your people. Now, my parents are both Holocaust survivors, as is my father-in-law. Trust me, my husband and I lived in a home where it was talked about a lot. It's a living memory for us. But in future generations, they're going to need to have actual ways of remembering and having it be not their whole identity, but a part of their identity, because they're not going to have parents or grandparents who could talk to them about it and who live through it, which I think is part of what we need to focus on here. I think that one of the fears that people have about Holocaust education is that we don't want it to be uh, the next generation's only identity or connection to Judaism. Jew is victim. That's not healthy. Which is why I think it's interesting, Maury, when you opened at the beginning, there are other things that we're commanded to remember, like the Exodus, like Shabbat. It's not all negative. But when we ignore the negative completely, I think Rabbi Greenberg is saying, that's also dangerous. And it's a matter of balancing having the different kinds of memories and the different kinds of identities that go into make us Jewish. Um, so I think it's that... It's interesting. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I mean, I was just thinking about it. I just pulled it up here. Um, a lot of our listeners, a lot of the people learning on here today probably have 
been uh, exposed to the Pew Report. And um, one of the statistics in there um, was that when we ask Jews about what is and is not essential to their own sense of Jewishness, 73% say remembering the Holocaust is essential, including 76% of Jews by religion and 60% of Jews by no religion, which is the way they categorize it in the report. Right. 73% said remembering the Holocaust is essential to their Jewishness. It's quite a statistic. That is. It's very and I would say that it, what it indicates is that the, the educators have done a great job of making the modern day Amalek, that is, the Nazis, into the focus of a modern day commandment of Zachor. And we see that 76% of the Jewish people, North American Jews, consider it to be an essential part of being Jewish. Interesting. Very interesting. Interesting. Um, I just want to throw out one other question more before we move on to the next text that you're presenting, which is it's interesting that in Deuteronomy it tells us that when God settles us in the land, I'm just pulling up the text here for myself, um, that that is when we are to utterly blot out uh, Amalek and to remember. And I think there's the interesting issue of you know, when you're vulnerable and you're the victim, when you're not in a position of power, what can you do and how do you react to this sort of hatred, especially when it's directed toward you, and how do you react and deal with it when you are secure, when you have your own land, when you have your own military? It raises different issues. For us today, thank God with the state of Israel, the, the memory, the, the mitzvah rather, of Zahor is very different from what it would have been like for Jews living in Poland in the 19th or 18th century. So I think that's an important thing just for us to consider how do we understand that given the modern political context in which we live? So just Very a thought. Good. That's, a, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, our youngest son is currently in the Israeli military, and there's no question. This past week, they took them all to Yad Vashem. They took all the soldiers in his pluga, in his unit, to Yad Vashem. They took them there um, in order to let them know that one of the big reasons that they're doing what they're doing is because never again. I actually saw an interesting, somebody wrote today, I, read, I mean I read, I read something interesting today in preparing, getting ready for here, that there's, it's interesting the difference between saying never and saying never again, hmm. right? To say never is like, you know, that'll never happen. Once it happens, then there's a certain very personal, powerful aspect to saying never again. Because as soon as you say never again, you're thinking about it. it. Happened to you now. The Torah, when it says remember, which is it saying? Remember? Is it? I'm saying is it saying re never or never again? I think it's saying never again because it happened to us. Amalek, it happened to us. So it is that that powerful zachor is it's yelling at us to remember it because it did happen and don't let it happen again. Now, how do you avoid allowing it to happen again? Now, we, we pointed out and we're going to move to uh, text six now <clears throat> that the the Torah itself. Um, seems to be somewhat contradictory. In the book of Exodus in Shemot, there it seems that God says, I've got your back. I'll take care of this. You write it down, and believe me, I'll be there to do battle with them in every generation. And then, over in the book of Deuteronomy, all of a sudden the yoke of the responsibility to do battle is put on our shoulders. So which one is it? What happened? And which one do we relate to more? So here, um, Rabbi uh, Dov Linzer, the Rosh Hashiva and Dean of Yeshiva Chovei Torah in New York, um, he sort of addresses this discomfort that Jews have with the notion of blotting out an entire nation. Because I don't know if you made this, I think we made the point pretty clear, but let's talk about it again. What does it mean? It doesn't mean just kill all the soldiers. It doesn't just kill all the bad guys. Blotting out a nation means blotting out, according to the way it's described, every man, woman, and child, and all of their cattle and all of their possessions completely erasing them. That's not easy to deal with for modern Jews. It doesn't seem to be all that politically correct. So let's take a look at what Rabbi Linzer writes in terms of the, the notion of how Jews creatively have uh, almost, in a sense, reread this or interpreted it in a way that makes it sit a little better with us. Look, look what it says. <clears throat> um, yes. Text 6. All right. Uh, 
So here Rabbi Linzer writes, three mitzvot. One, remember. Two, do not forget. And three, sandwich in between, you shall blot out their memory. Kill them. Wipe them out. What possible message can we learn from this mitzvah? So he continues, God is a vengeful God. Violence must be met with violence. Even innocents, the infants and the future descendants of the original nation can be slaughtered by the hand of Israel when Israel is following God's command and is the agent of God's justice. Isn't this exactly the kind of issue that we're dealing with right here in the Middle East? During every war that we have, when innocent civilians are killed on the side of our enemies, the world takes us to task immediately for that. How could we possibly think that we could ever fulfill a commandment to wipe out an entire nation. So he writes, is this the message of Amalek? Is this the story that we tell? Right, because we were talking about this at the beginning. If we're going to tell our children and our grandchildren to remember something, what are we going to tell them to remember? Something that is going to make them very uncomfortable in terms of its practical application? So he writes, is this the story that we tell? We know that it is not. It is not the story that we as a people have told. Having as a people been persecuted and slaughtered in the name of religion, and as witness today to the evils that can be perpetuated by a murderous, fundamentalist, religious belief, this also is not the story that we can ever tell. And continuing in line uh, um, 17, it is a story first and foremost of moral grappling, of a people who treasure the sanctity of human life, and who believe in a God who commands them to preserve human life. It is the story of a people who can only be confounded by such a command. Where is the justice in God's decree? Such a command violates God's own treasuring of human lives and the most fundamental sense of justice. So here he makes the point very clear. Understanding the decree as we have understood it up until now is very challenging to us on a theological level. It goes back to even the story of Abraham arguing with God over the destruction of the cities of Stom and Amorah. Right? Will the, will the, just, will the, will the uh, um, judge of the entire earth not do justice? Same here. Is it just? Do we understand this as just to destroy every, every single man, woman, and child? Innocent or not? And so Rabbi Linzer continues, and we move over to uh, line 36. <clears throat> it is a story of moving from the passage in Devarim, from the charge of Timche, that you shall blot out, to the passage in Shemot, and the declaration of Macho Emche, that I, God, will blot out. It is the transferring of the war from B'nai Yisrael, from the children of Israel, to God. Milchama Lashem Be'amalek, a war of God against the Malek, Midor Dor. The story that we have chosen to tell from generation to generation is the story of Shemot, the story of God's war, not of ours. The story of a war not against the people, but against the violence, against evil. Says Rabbi Linzer, we are truly an amazing people. We have taken the mitzvah to destroy Amalek, a mitzvah that disrupts our moral and religious order, a mitzvah that embraces violence, and through interpretation, through choosing how we will tell the story, we have transformed it into a mitzvah of memory, a mandate to restore moral order and to repudiate violence. There's a lot here to think about, but what Rabbi Linzer is saying is that as we have generation after generation taken upon ourselves the responsibility to tell this story, when we've come to the time in our existence, especially, I would say, in the current situation, as Ruth pointed out before, when we as the Jewish people have strength, incredible strength, in the Israel Defense Forces, with all that strength, we can no longer tell the story of being a nation whose goal it is to destroy completely another nation. And so instead of telling the Deuteronomy story, we turn back and tell the Exodus story, the story of God's war against Amalek. And we're soldiers in that war. And for us, it's not about blotting out the people. It's about blotting out the violence. 
It's about blotting out the nature of Amalek in the world. And the point of bringing this text in our lesson is just to show you that even though there's a simple commandment to remember, the question of what it is we're to remember and how it is we are to perpetuate that memory is not so clear. And it definitely can change from generation to generation, given a different context, given different circumstances, uh, given different values that may exist for us. And he actually has a beautiful line. My favorite line in there uh, is when he says, um, uh, we are truly an amazing people. And I, I, I accept that. We are an amazing people. And perhaps what makes us eternal is our ability to rethink and readapt our messages from generation to generation. Okay. Um, I guess we have a little more time, don't we? Ruth, you're going to continue, I think? Yes, we're going to continue with text 8. And I just wanted to say that as you were talking, Maury, it, it reminded me of, there's a story in the in the Gemara about Rabbi Meir and his wife, Boria. And Rabbi Meir was so frustrated and angry because there are these bandits who are just making life miserable for everyone in the town. And he asks God to destroy the bandits. And Boria takes him to task for that. And, and she says to him, don't ask God to destroy the wicked. Ask God to destroy the wickedness. And in the Shemona Esrei, we say, that we want God to destroy the wickedness. So we really have moved the message from about destroying people, which is a very difficult, I mean, it's a genocidal message, it's awful, to the idea of destroying the wickedness and hopefully turning them around, as the story with Abba Meir goes, turning these bandits into good people. And so we do change the message, and we have to ask ourselves when we read the story, what is the lesson that we want to take away from it? And our lesson might be different from the lessons of our you know, generations past. Right, so, right. That's a good point. It's a good point. And I think, I think it's actually, you know, yitamu chatayim minarets. That is, that's exactly the point. I think that's how we, most of us relate to this. That our, if we have any calling in the world, if we, if we are a people that's perpetuating, perpetuating memories now for thousands of years, um, with embedded in these memories and stories are eternal timeless lessons, I think that it's all about really, clearly it's all about ridding the world of, doing wrong, not about not of wrongdoers. As you mentioned very in the beginning of our broadcast, we have a whole way of thinking that there's this notion of tshuva, of repentance, that people can change. And so if people can change, it's not about the people that we're trying to eradicate, it's about their behavior that needs to be eradicated. Now admittedly it's not so easy, let's be honest, to differentiate between the terrorist and the terror. That's, it's, it's not easy at all. Um, but in a certain way, that's what Rabbi Linzer is suggesting that we consider, and that what it is that we're about is eradicating terror from the world. That's not easy to do, but through education and perhaps through standing for something, generation after generation, we we can take a take a stab at it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to move on now to uh, the last text um, in, in this packet. It's text number eight. It's Professor Shmuel Glick, uh, Ruminations on Memory and its Transmission to the Next Generation. And you'll see that one of the questions that he's going to be dealing with is, well, how do you do that? Um, I mean, we can have marches on Washington, we can get involved, we can, we can be politically or socially active, but are there other things that we do? Is there a uniquely Jewish way of keeping that memory alive from generation to generation? Especially, as we mentioned before, when the generation that went through it, or the generation of children who grew up with parents who went through it, are no longer here, what do we do to keep it not just a historical event, but something that's actually a part of our identity. So let's take a look at this text together and see what he has to say. So he starts off by saying, our generation is unique in the annals of Jewish history. It is a generation in which the famous line from Psalms has come to pass. He raised us from the dust. He will raise up the destitute from the refuse heap. From the darkest valley of the shadow of death, from the crematoria of, Aus of Auschwitz, our parents dusted themselves off rose from their mourning, and with great courage made their way to the land of their dreams, to a country with a glorious past, but with the present and future shrouded in uncertainty. Um, 
And, you know, again, being the, the child of survivors, the idea of knowing not just what my parents went through, but that they chose to live Jewish lives, marry, raise Jewish children, keep a Jewish home, that's an incredible act of courage. And to be able to witness that is something that is truly amazing and it's astounding and it's, it's a great role model for us. And so how do we take Amalek and put it into that sort of a context? And so uh, he continues with historical memory in Judaism. And he says, historical memory is a central motif of Judaism. Deuteronomy 32.7 instructs us to remember the days of yore, learn of ancient times, ask your father and he shall tell you, your elders and they shall recount for you. The Jewish circle of life revolves around memory. It is our daily prayers, morning and evening. The memory of the exodus from Egypt has pride of place. This is not, however, the only memory mentioned in the Torah. Other positive commandments to remember remain as scriptural edicts have less of an influence on history, such as remember and do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness, or remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam on your journey out of Egypt, and finally, remember what Amalek did to you on your journey out of Egypt, and that of course comes from our text in Deuteronomy. Um, and it is very telling, by the way, in terms of our identity as Jews, that every day in our prayers, many times, we do recount the Exodus and that formative piece of our relationship with God and with the Jewish community. So he continues in line 26. Why did the commandments remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy? And remember the day you left Egypt, house of bondage, have such an active resonance in the collective Jewish memory and other commands we to remember are left at the wayside. The Sabbath and Passover are so entrenched in the Jewish consciousness because the command to keep and observe was part of the command to remember. Keeping or observing the ritual component of the commandment, the celebratory meal and its symbols, the traditions and laws, the communal prayer, etc., which leads to memory, preserves the active component of the commandment and keeps the commandment relevant to a changing reality. It's a very interesting point. We read about Miriam. We read about how we angered God time and again in the wilderness. Not our best moments in Jewish history, but there you have it. But we don't have a ritual that goes with it. So when you're studying the Torah portion, you remember it. You read about it. But that does not have the same impact as Shabbat and as Passover because of the rituals that we have with those holidays. We all remember a Passover Seder. We all remember the foods, the rituals, fighting over who was going to say the Manish Tana. It builds up our identity and our memory. Uh, and so he says here, he continues, I lost my place, um, line 32, I think it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. The Sabbath and Passover, thank you, are so entrenched in the Jewish consciousness because the command to keep and observe, oh, yes, we read that, was part of the command to remember, I apologize. Uh, so line 39, without the command to keep the Sabbath and Passover, it is doubtful that these holidays would have been any different than any of the other scriptural commands to remember, which remain in scripture, but have no resonance in the present. Ever since Jews returned to their land, more memorial days and more holidays have been added to the calendar, most importantly Holocaust Memorial Day and Memorial Day for IDF soldiers. I wonder what the fate of these memorial days will be in subsequent generations. <clears throat> Will they be like the past commands of the Torah, or like the many memorial days for past massacres and martyrdom, such as the, the massacre of 1096, the massacre of 1648, and so many others, which are part of the general passive memory of hardship? Or perhaps, <laughs> I can't see it, these days will be actively remembered and commemorated in subsequent generations. How can we ensure that seminal events such as the Holocaust and the resettlement of Israel be preserved in the collective memory for many generations to come? That, of course, is the key question. And so the answer to this question depends on what we pass on to the next generation. The March of the Living, libraries, museums, and school ceremonies are all important components of learning about the Holocaust and the return, but they're not enough to entrench this memory as an active memory, as an influential memory. Only if we can transmit the narrative to the next generation, the grand saga of the Holocaust and the rising from the ashes, in such a way that each man, woman, and child can recount it in simple language through a ritual framework, will it find a secure place in people's hearts and minds. 
And I think what's important here, he, he makes a very important point that says that rituals don't just preserve memory, but they create memory. And that's what you have with Shabbat and with Passover, with Purim, with um, things like the March of the Living, that you are creating memory and creating identity through these rituals. And if you don't have those active pieces, those, those special days, the rituals, then it's going to fall by the wayside like so many of the other remembers that we are commanded to remember in the Tanakh. Uh, so we need to be active and ritual plays a large part in that according to Rabbi Glick. Right. I can, I can also can speak to the comparison of my experience of, uh, of attending uh, Holocaust Day Memorial events in the United States and attending Holocaust Memorial events here in Israel. And um, I I have the sense that here in Israel, it'll be the memory will be preserved more strongly for a longer time than it will in the diaspora community, and that's only for one reason. Because here, um, because of the way that these holidays come, what happens is you have the celebration of Passover with all of the messages of Exodus and freedom, followed very closely then uh, by the Holocaust Memorial Day. That Holocaust Memorial Day is a day in which people mourn the tragedy of what happened here in Israel. The language of never again is very, very powerful. And all of the high school kids are putting on these um, ceremonies because they've been the ones who just come back from their trips to Poland. And they're the ones who in a year or two are going to be going into the Israeli military. So therefore for them there's a very personal message here. And you can feel the, the pattern of life here. You celebrate Exodus, but then you're taken back to what happens when you go back to the to the um, horrors of the Holocaust. But you know that the next week, what's going to be happening is you're going to say never again, and you're going to memorialize Israeli soldiers um, who stood up for and uh, for the in defense of Jewish lives, followed the very next day by Israel Independence Day. There's like a one, two, three, four punch here every year. You feel it in the country. They're all connected very powerfully. And they're all being um, per, um, uh, they're all being uh, actually functionally um, um, presented by youth, all of them by youth. And so uh, I, I have a feeling uh, there's a, something about it that's been written into the fabric. It's been connected very directly with Passover and very directly with Israel Independence Day. And as a result, I think it might last even longer than it and potentially will in the diaspora communities. Just my particular perspective on it. Um, okay, uh, living here in America, I <laughs> I hope you're not right, um, but but I certainly do see the the pattern that we have, and I, I suppose because here in Detroit our connections to Israel is so strong, and the um, the celebrations that we have, uh, the commemorations on Yom Asi, Karun, and Yom Aksmoud are so intense that I think those connections are made here as well. Um, but to wrap things up, because it is almost 2 o'clock, uh, if we think about the enduring understandings and what we take away from today's uh, lesson, we have the notion that the preservation of memory is a focus, it's a central focus of Jewish living. We are who we are because we remember our past and we take it with us as we move into the future. And memory fills multiple Jewish needs. It gives us direction and hope. It helps us hopefully to prevent these events from happening again. It inspires us to bring goodness and ahavat uh, chinam, unconditional love, into the world. It does give us a piece of our identity, and it can also give us comfort, especially in knowing, as we see in Shemot, that God hopefully will be there with us and, and protect us. Uh, and as we saw in text 8, ritual preserves and enhances and it adapts memory, and those rituals help us teach our children and help them to preserve and understand their focus of Jewish living. So I hope that uh, you all enjoyed this uh, lesson with Rabbi Maury Schwartz and me, and hopefully we will see you at many other Melton classes and functions. So toda rabba. Thanks, Ruth. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for, uh, for sharing this hour with me, and uh, I hope that everyone who uh, had the opportunity to participate um, enjoyed it as, uh, as much, and that the messages of Zachor um, will be those that you will remember for many years to come.
Thank you.